God damn it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Where, where are you? Uh, I'm in Chicago. Chicago, right. Yeah. Um, so, let's I had, see. I had your book and I couldn't find it just before I was... Uh, I thought, oh, I'll get it and I'll have it here on my desk. I could oh, yeah. not find it, but I've got it. I would say your book. You've probably got more than one, but the one that... <laughs> I've got yeah. yours here somewhere as well. All right, um, I, yeah. I think it's over there. Yeah. Um, so, oh, yeah, before we... Oh, I'm, I wasn't sure, you know, is, is it, you want a mask or is this, <laughs> like... Yeah, okay. You, you okay? Like, but... I'm going to sit back. I mean, I don't know with what you do, if you can put that through the screen or what. I don't know. <laughs> um, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Face the Truth. This is awesome. Um, I am uh, really excited to talk to this guy. I've been a fan of his uh, for years um, with his illusion work and just his brilliance and his ideas. And there's some fun things that I would like to talk to him about having to do with that. But also, the dude is an awesome painter. He loves to paint. Um, he's really into caricature and painting and uh um, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting fella, if you, if you will. So anyways, um, everyone, please welcome the one and only Darren Brown. Thank you very much. Yes, so thank you for joining me. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's very, this is very exciting. And I've loved your work for so long. So this is it's very nice to finally meet you. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. It, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, to be honest, I was thinking about this and I, um, I, I caught up on a few videos of yours and different, I mean, there's like billions of them out there. And, um, and it's, I find it interesting, the, the range of, of, of things that you've done. Yeah. And, you know, you'll have like these real deep intellectual um, just like these, these challenges and these, these experiments that are just mind blowing, like literally. And then you're on James Corden, um, you know, t t talking about, uh, you know, that number 45 or whatever that, that bit, I just watched that last night with my daughters and I was trying to show them my, like, Hey, this is the dude I'm talking to tomorrow. And, uh, they thought it was great. And they were like, what did he, how did he do that? You know, <laughs> it was amazing. Oh, that's nice. Um, but it's, it's amazing to me just to see that range and what I was wondering right off the bat was um, it's got to be a little bit nerve wracking uh, being in a relationship with you or getting to know you in person, knowing what you do, because like I'm talking to you, you sent me um, a message uh, saying, Hey, you know, this is going to be great to talk to you. Uh, here's a few things. Um, you know, let's just not, let's not talk about those things, but whatever. Um, and I, and I was thinking, is he planting something in my mind? Is he trying to do something? It's like, am I going to be sitting here and all of a sudden I'm going to be like, Darren, what are you doing? And then just <laughs> knock myself out or something. <laughs> so how is it in your personal life? I'm just curious because it's gotta be something that people right away are like, is he, is he getting inside me right now? Like <laughs> I had that just recently that um, I was at a friend's house who was having a Zoom with her friend, and her friend was a big fan of mine for the you know the mind weird stuff that I do, and um, <laughs> but didn't know that this mutual friend actually knew me, let alone that I was there in the house. So during this sort of Zoom conversation, I, I sort of got the friend that I knew to bring up the subject of me. So they talked, and as they spoke about me, I just sort of moved into shot behind for a bit, and then <laughs> yeah. off. And this girl was like, "Was that?" What was that? And she, of course, you know, she denied any knowledge yeah. of knowing anything on me being there. Um, so yeah, it, it's, uh, I forgot your question now. Sorry. <laughs> it was, uh, well, I mean, it's just oh, like, yeah, but people yeah. Have, yeah, people getting weirded out by it. I actually, yeah, I, I think the, um, when I started doing all that stuff, which was when I was a law student, um, uh, so quite a while back, but I, I was always trying to kind of, you know, hypnotize and, and do suggestion stuff and always wanted to impress people with tricks and blah, blah, blah. And I've, I mean, I've really, I've really grown out of that, uh, I hope, but I, I'm, I have. So weirdly, the sort of, I think the, the way to be in life 
is to not try and like control a bunch of stuff that you can't control, right? Whereas my job when I'm doing that stuff is to do exactly the opposite, is to control stuff I seemingly can't control. Mm. So I think the reality is how I am in life is so different now from how I am when I'm doing those things that I think probably in terms of actually like, you know, meeting people and making friends and so on, I, it, it's just, it's so not me that I imagine people get over that pretty quickly. I hope so. I don't really. Uh, oh, okay. I just, I just find that really interesting. Cause I mean, it's, it's like, I've, I've met, you know, friends of my wives or whatever. And they're like, Oh, I'm a therapist. And the whole time I'm like, are they judging everything I say? Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just, so I don't know. I just imagine like. <laughs> my favorite course. Cause when I'm doing stage shows that, that people's they've already done half the work, half the suggestive work themselves by the time they come to the show, because their expectations are higher. Yeah. And I know over the years, the 20 years of doing shows that I've done they've, that, that, that has grown. Like I had to work a lot harder to get people to do what I wanted them to do back at the start than uh, now. And I just finished a Broadway run back when, you know, there was a, a Broadway in uh, the end of last <laughs> yeah. year, I think. And um, that was interesting because I thought this is like a brand new audience now and I'm, it's going to be like going back 10, 20 years. That's uh, interesting too. That, to, man, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. That's really amazing. Was that exciting? How, was, it was, there, was it a long yeah. run? It was a six month run. I think actually it's the wow, longest wow. like one man magic show run in history or something. It was, uh, wow. I don't know, I'm not sure. And it was the same, I suppose the name, um, what's his name? Doug Henning won't mean anything to you, but it's the same theater that this guy did a very famous magic show back in the seventies. So that was kind of cool. It was, yeah, I, it was, it was amazing. The, the, that whole New York theater experience is very different from, from here. Here you're just doing a job. And I think, I don't think it has any more glamor to it than that. Whereas there is a definite like, aura around it which is yeah mm. it's fun but you can see how people go mad as well and take it all <laughs> but yeah it was it was lovely it was really uh really great that is so funny how like <laughs> that idea of before the before the people even are there there it's like it's just the the anxiety or the anticipation of knowing that you're going to do something where people they're already susceptible and open you know, yeah. like, so yeah. that's, that's a pretty, and this is, this is one thing I love about you too, is, and uh, why I like to do this podcast. And, and again, thank you. I appreciate you coming on here, man. But the, the art of, of this, you know, because like, I didn't know that you were a lawyer before um, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> and because the way that you set things up, it's like, you're, you're trying to win a case in a way. And it's, it's, I, I can imagine you being just an insanely dangerous lawyer. Um, but there's this art to it, you know, there's an art to the setup and the, 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 the design. And that's what I find so fascinating is watching like the way that you're wording things and kind of hinting. And I've seen some of the videos where you all tap and do little things and you kind of, you know, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And so I'm curious what, I mean, you you said you started getting into that aspect when you were when you were a lawyer, a practicing lawyer. Yeah. So yeah, I, I never I never made it to a law to law as a job. I was only studying. Uh, okay. My like graduate degree was in it, so I I um yeah I did that. But by the time I'd graduated, I was already doing gigs as as a hypnotist and as a magician. Which mm. what I've done is kind of brought those two areas together. But at the time, there were two different things I was doing. So. Um, so yeah, and then then I started, then I did, um, so it all started with hypnosis. I saw a guy do a show in my first year who was sort of wonderful. It's a guy called Martin Taylor, he's a British hypnotist. Um, and I just decided I was gonna learn that and I oh. did. And then it just, it clearly ticked loads of boxes in terms of wanting to feel in control and wanting to perform, wanting to impress people, all those kind of things that are annoying <laughs> about people uh, in the early twenties. So I, I <laughs> did lots of that. And then uh, I sort of, uh, but it's, it's quite a difficult, hyp hypnosis is a difficult thing to gig a lot with, unless you're prepared to sort of be doing that kind of show where you're just making people look like idiots and also work in environments that are not very conducive to getting it working. So a lot of the time it just ends up being people playing along, which is not what I wanted to do. So I didn't do that much of it, but I did a lot of magic, close up magic in restaurants and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a couple of books for magicians that got my name known in that world. So there was this TV production company that were then looking for someone who did mind reading. And by that point, I'd sort of fused these two weird magic hypnosis worlds into, into wow. doing that. Um, and yeah, they kind of got in touch and they 
they've been looking for somebody to do it. And they weren't, there's a lot of mentalists around now that, that they weren't back then. I think I, mm. I sort of started a bit of a, a bit. Of, I knew four, I'm sure there were more, but I only knew four people that did it when I started. Now it's a lot more popular. Um, but at the time it was a weird sort of uh, fringy sort of thing. Mm. Um, and, uh, and yeah, yeah, that, that was, that was kind of, um, that was that, but painting is something I've, always done since I was very small so uh, and actually the more you do the more you end up with a job that's quite outgoing and uh you know public it's really nice if you're essentially quite introverted which I am to have that other thing that you do which is also quite you know involving and time consuming yeah yeah uh -huh. but it's completely <laughs> separate from other people that's you know that is nice yeah and that's what I was going to ask you next is when so when you you started doing this other stuff it seems like you were kind of learning as you went along and opportunities happen and doors open, you walked through them and just kept developing and pushing yourself. But you, you were painting much, much before that early on in your life, you started. And what got yeah. you into, into that? Well, I was, I remember being four or five at school, uh, at university, mm -hmm. uh, at school. And I, um, I used to draw witches. So like, profile like old lady <laughs> uh, yeah. and i was obsessed with drawing witches um which is kind of funny because in a way that's that's just like a caricature isn't it and it, it's sort of so yeah I, i'd always done that and then um always drew a lot but it was always about faces i sort of i, I and i did uh so you know i live in england and we have this we do our a levels which is like you're, you're 17, uh, 18, uh, 17 and 18 years old before you finish that level of schooling. And you do like three of them and they're your big subjects. And I did, uh, I, I did four, so you can do three or four. And my fourth one was arts. And I was halfway through doing that. And I got sick of drawing daffodils and peppers and shoes with the laces untied. So I, mm. I dropped yeah. out of it um, <laughs> and stole a bunch of paints from school. Um, and there were those weird like i don't know they poster paints that's sort of like the ones that smell really bad yeah that's right and yeah, i like yeah. yeah. and I, I i like i didn't know anybody else that painted um i hadn't really enjoyed as i said doing it doing it at school so i just i just had these paints and i kind of um uh really shitty paints and i i would paint as <laughs> all the time i was at university i was painting i used to draw teachers at school and again all all caricatured stuff and then it's funny that when you're just sort of on your own and you've completely got your own path through something. And it, it's, um, I, some, a friend recommended uh, um, acrylics, which is now what I use. Um, I, I feel like I should, should I be using oils? Is that whole, you know, that whole thing? Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, it just every now and then I'll meet somebody who just um, gives me some little nudge into a, into a new yeah. uh, direction. But yeah, it's, I, I've, I don't ever really remember not, drawing it was certainly not a yeah not a thing i consciously started and caricaturing was never it's not like a conscious thing for me i'm not exactly that's the same as me that's exactly yeah. the same did you get did you find yourself getting in trouble in school Doing yeah it? yeah completely i think it was all part yeah. of kind of showing off thing which performing eventually took all that into like a you know a, a valid arena right if you're a performer it's a way to direct off. that energy <laughs> exactly. But yeah, I used to do caricatures of teachers. I used to impersonate teachers. I was really yeah. annoying, I think. And, um, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, the same. That's very much like what I was like. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got in trouble quite a bit drawing teachers, impersonating them. Yeah. I was going to tell you, you know, when you were drawing the witch thing, it's funny. You know, like when you're younger and you, you, you I mean, for me anyways, I'm, I'm sure you can relate, but I was so, so obsessed with drawing. So I would, it would be, I would go from topic to topic. So it would be like, sharks and just like my my school papers would just be full of sharks just you know that's all i would draw um and then i went through this terminator phase mm. where i just I, I don't remember which terminator movie i had seen but i just was so fascinated with the fact that there's this person and underneath there's like this metal robot and slowly as the movie goes on the flesh just starts to get removed and it's hanging and so i would just do these drawings in my in my paper that would just be, you know, whole, like oh, it'd be a person's face, but partially like hanging off and, and all, you know, just, it was just pretty grotesque. Yeah. And after a while I got brought to the, to a, a school therapist 
And my teachers were, were concerned. And they, they're, they're, something's wrong with this guy. He's getting really demented. And they, they called my parents and my parents had to come in. And then I, when I, when they finally, you know, showed me the work that they were concerned about, I was like, Oh no, those are terminators. I tried to explain to them. Like, like they thought I was like a young serial killer or something, you know, I'm just uh, in the making. I was like, no, no, no. Like that's a, that's a definite fate. Like I did that. I not terminated so much, but that's a different, I'm older, but um, like knives stuck in. Yeah. And I was, you know, interesting. Like what's wrong with this kid? That shortening of the knife. Like, what's that about? It's such yeah. a, those kind of, um, <laughs> weird horror i mean i love i've always loved horror films so i suppose maybe it was yeah I'm, i remember when i was uh probably around uh six my mum who worked as a like a secretary in a in a, a business she brought back uh what feels my memory of it is this giant ream of paper but it's probably say 500 sheets i remember they they were yellow and i'd never seen like it was such an excess of just like blank paper and i was utterly mesmerized by it and i remember i would just like the thought of like, i could just do a little scribble and then scrunch that up and throw it away it was such a kind of arresting uh idea and it was the best present i'd ever got so i used to i was like drawing and drawing and there was a um a popular <laughs> newspaper cartoonist at the time um oh, i can't remember his name she's terrible um but yeah the, the the cartoon strip was called fred bassett and it was quite popular mm. at the time in england it's a dog uh a bassett hound called fred but yeah the dad <laughs> had one of those basic like cartoon noses. Let me get a Sharpie, uh, which, you know, is sort of like that, right? Okay, yeah. It's like a kind of upside down seven. Um, <laughs> and that's for sale, by the way. Um, and so I, I remember at the age of six, seeing that shape and the kind of, the sort of the foreshortening of, you know, because sometimes you get it from the front and it would just be a line. And I remember sitting trying to work out how you draw a three-dimensional nose at the yeah. edge of, on paper. And I remember doing this. I remember having a pen and going like up in the air. And, <laughs> yeah. and I look at it and it's like, no, that's just two dots. That's not it. Um, yeah, I, I remember funny. vividly at, the, at that age try, trying to get that sort of, um, all that stuff right and how exciting it was. It's all tied in with the excitement of all this, all this paper that my mum got me. It was just, um, it was just amazing. Do you, have, do you have intense memories of that kind of, Oh yeah. I mean, I just, I was literally, you know, like I really related to when you were on James Gordon, I, I really related to uh, you, you were saying, what, how did you say it? Um, uh, dick brain or brain oh, dick, dick brain. or whatever, yeah. dick brain. Um, and I thought that was hilarious because I mean, I, I definitely, I was not like, I wasn't, I wouldn't call myself an academic kid. I, I, I was just so obsessed with my art though, that that's all I focused on my whole life. And and I got picked on and bullied like hardcore. Um, I was afraid to go to school. I got peed on, spit on, you know, all kinds of fun stuff. That was just the teachers. That was the what were the kids like? Yeah, no, you know, it's funny that you say that. Is is man, it was completely a different time then because like I would go to the teachers, I would go to the principal, and nobody did anything. You know what I mean? It was it was like one of those things where it's like ah, whatever. Um, it happened in front of teachers, and they didn't do anything. Oh, um, but. I was, I really relate to when you were talking about, even though it was it's, you're joking around and being funny, but I think uh, you made such a great point about creative types who, you know, like, where, where are those kids now? Like, what are they doing now? Um, you know, I, I picture them as used car salesmen somewhere in North Wisconsin. Um, but it's like, yeah. none, of, know, yeah. not, none of the adults with the interesting jobs, none of the artists and the creatives had had the easy life at school it just doesn't it just doesn't, yeah. doesn't go up at all is it so, no, 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 no 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 it's 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 so funny um a few years back um i painted uh the time the, the pope for time magazine yeah. and um it was it was really interesting and it was fun in chicago i had a lot of interviews with media and so on and it, it was really cool you know i felt very honored and excited about it and as i was um on a trip so it was like about three four weeks of this happening in chicago and then i went on a trip to nashville with my wife and we're driving and i get a call uh or i got an email actually while i was driving and to to request to call me and it was from my uh the town i went to high school in and i hadn't i had i had not been back there at all since i left i was 18 and i moved right to chicago so i went from north wisconsin in this middle middle of nowhere place 
um, to Chicago and I haven't been back. I still haven't been back uh, since 1996. Fuck that place. Um, And the funny thing was, is they they were very proud that I came from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and they wanted to have an, an interview with me. And so I, I, I was doing the interview while I was in the car driving and the guy was just like, you know, hey, this is WW, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, oh, so we've got Eau Claire native Jason Seiler. And he's like all excited and everything. And he's like, and uh, and then he's he's expecting this real heartfelt thing. And I, I basically said, hey, Eau Claire sucks. <laughs> and I, I, I and I said, I'll never go back. I have no intentions on going back. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. I, I still I'm still haunted by high school. Uh, it was terrible, and I, I hate it. <laughs> I basically just told him, and he's like, okay. <laughs> okay, next. Yeah, like that did not go well. I just felt like being straight up about it because uh, bullying is the worst thing, man. So it just, it's just one of those things. Even though it's been like 25 years, it's still one of those things where like, man. Were you, were you an only child at least no. at the time? No, no, I had a, I have a no. younger brother. Um and he's like the opposite uh, in, in some ways. He was like the, the jock kid who um, yeah. all of his friends were the guys that picked on me. <laughs> oh, God. And he's my younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, well, I, I wasn't exactly bullied, but I, I wasn't I wasn't sporty. And I was kind of just I was just an easy, I guess, a bit of an easy target. But I wasn't like I wasn't wasn't bullied but I was certainly intimidated and I, I got beaten up like a couple of times but nothing nothing much, nothing sort of serious but I mean I'm having something like you know drawing or whatever is aside from just so I was an only child until I was nine right so mm. even though then obviously my brother arrived but there's a big gap between us so there is also that thing that if you've played on your own as a kid if that's what you got used to you take that I think into your adult life too don't oh, you? The, for sure the, the, the painting drawing reading writing the things that interest me are, are um you know qu- quite solitary things um let alone if you'd be made to feel like an outsider as a kid then you really like that becomes your identity like you hang on to that yeah. you defend it when you're older um but yeah if you don't if you don't have I mean, the great thing about paint drawing at that age is that not only is it giving you something for yourself and something kind of you know creative but also it's kind of it's something you show and people admire and it becomes one of those little um things between you and the world that you know yeah. could kind of impress people which magic is like the quickest most fraudulent route to doing that i mean did you, a childish urge did you find that the drawing was sort of a a superpower in a way because that's kind of how i always felt totally yeah like yeah. i felt like like even when i was being picked on um i remember like specifically there's just one kid in 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 one of my classes who was such a jerk to me all the time and then, then he had the the balls to ask me if I would draw something for him for his art class, and I was just like, "What the heck?" But at that at that time, I was like, "Wait a minute, he respects me a little <laughs> bit <laughs> for the for the fact that he knows that I can draw well." Um, and so it's just it was like one of those things where it did it almost does in a way feel like like I I sometimes think like if I wasn't picked on so much would I have turned out to be the artist that I am? But then it's sort of a catch 22 because I, part of the reason I feel like I didn't have any friends and I wasn't social with everybody was because I was so obsessed with drawing all the time. Yeah. So it was kind of meant to just be in this weird spot. I mean, do you relate with that at all? I mean, it's kind of. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I was all my memory of childhood. I've never had like a group of friends I've had, you know, I've had friends, but never like a gang or a group. So um, occasionally they'd sort of come over, but not very often. I just used to sit up in my room and draw and make Lego things. And um, <laughs> even like music, I wasn't even really even listening to music. It was all mm. kind of right, visual, that kind of creative stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was like very happy with that and I never felt lonely i mean my my mum did an interview for a tv show that was about me and she was um she said she thought i was probably quite lonely as a kid and it never never occurred to me that, that was... you were fine that way though that's that's kind of what yeah. i was trying to say is like yeah. like i you know as soon as i could get home and get off the bus and get go to my room i was just fine man just, yeah i would just get my i'd do my homework as quick as possible and just start drawing you know 
and and that was like that was just all I wanted to do. It was fun. And so I mean, it's pretty much and and even with my life, the way I've I progressed from from that point was I didn't really have um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do except for that I wanted to draw, and I just kept doing it and doing it, and then like I said before, like doors open. And I mm. kind of just went through them and it just kept, you know, mm. developing that way. Uh, Cause it, I mean, it's, it's weird. Um, I'm originally from North Wisconsin and it's like, what are you going to do when you grow up? It's like, well, I just want to draw. I just want to draw, but there, that's not really normal up there. Um, I think, I think know. there's a lesson, there's a lesson here. Sorry. The, the, um, the, I think any type of success in life, this is particularly, I think appropriate if you're creative, um, I think, it, I think there is a magical formula for success. Mm. And the magical formula is talent plus energy. And really what that boils down to is those are the only parts of the equation that you're in control of yourself, right? You can develop your talent, uh, mm. yeah. obviously, and, but you also want to develop the energy with which you get it out there. Uh, because if you've got all the talent, but no one's seeing it, you're just drawing in your bedroom or doing whatever you do just privately, that's not going to get you very far. But if you've got all the self-promotional energy and no, edit, no talent to back it up, it's not going to get you very far either. But put those two things together, and that is all you are in control of. So this is kind of a stoic move, like you separate what are you in control of and what are the things you're not in control of. And you can't control those things anyways. If you try, you're just going to make yourself anxious, right? So you kind of decide those things are fine. So with matters of success, all the other stuff, whether you get the gig or you get the phone call or this job happens or whatever, you decide is nothing to do with you. That's none of your business. Your business is developing your talent and the energy with which you get it out there. And this really holds. I remember Brian Cranston talking about um, auditions and he said and this is before he got well known, but he said um, he never worked more and also never felt better about working than when he decided and after he decided my job at an, at an audition is not to get the job. My job is to present this character in a compelling way and so on. Mm. And then, you know, I walk away. And there's a million reasons why I may or may not get it that are nothing to do with me or why it's better suited to somebody else. He says, it's like if that job that went to somebody else, it's like you found that person's wallet. You've gone, oh, there, that was, that was yours. Like it's nothing to do with you, it's for that person. And you just do your bit and the rest has nothing to do with you. And I, um, oh. I, I think, I think it, really holds particularly in sort of competitive uh creative industries it's just talent plus energy uh yeah, and then to be a star great. to be a star in any area it's attitude the style and attitude that come into yeah. it, that thing that then separates you but um yeah i think it's uh i think it does it does hold but so for those of us that i guess also start out early a lot of that talent and not so much maybe <clears> special <throat> energy but you know, a lot of that has got has got going and then you don't have to think too much consciously about it as you get older yeah i mean there's i that's that's amazing i totally agree with that um there's also the passion of it i believe you know like i one of the things that drives me crazy is when people they they think that you're born talented and they mm. you know it must be so lucky and amazing to be to be born so gifted and it's like i, I don't i don't know if i believe in that i believe more in maybe i was born uh with a you know i don't even know if i was born with it I, like like a hard work ethic i was I was surrounded by that and my dad uh, he worked my brother and I pretty hard with chores ever since I can remember and we we always worked for very hard and I also um I think maybe if anything there's like a passion you know you feel like you have a passion for something and I've always just felt like like the passion uh with patience and and a lot of dedication uh, can go a long ways and you know just little things like for example like I can't I cannot not look at you while we're talking here and, and not think about all the shapes I'm seeing, um, all the, the color re, uh, relationships <laughs> and, and, and just like exactly like the relationships between your, your eyes and your nose and just the, the kind of color and what color would I use? Like, you know, I can't stop thinking about those things. Um, and like just like edges and, 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 you know, values and that sort of a thing. Um, but then, you know, it's, it's all part of how I'm, you know, I just feel like I have in a way, and I'm sure this is, this is how you, you must feel when you paint is you, you put so much passion into it. And it's, it's something that I think just doesn't really turn off. And when you actually get that time alone to draw and paint, it's like, that's why it's such a nice release because all that stuff has been going on. Like you're thinking about it all the time. And now it's a chance to actually get it yeah. down you know 
yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, passion is the thing that just holds it all together, doesn't it? And makes that, you know, you're not going to develop your talent or develop your energy unless you're passionate about it. It's the thing that just makes <laughs> yeah. it pleasurable. And again, I guess the same with anything. I mean, the, the things, me. the things we want to kind of to learn, like learning stuff in life and developing skills and all of that. It's so much of it is about you know finding that thing and then just sort of attacking it from every every bizarre unusual angle that's you know the stuff we get we, we love and get passionate about we don't just follow the like a school curriculum would teach you how to develop an interest in that thing yeah. you just start to see it from you know every every possible angle um and then it's sort of it's sort of effortless you don't you know you don't you don't think of it i've always found it um i remember particularly with caricature the first person I'm sure this is something you've thought about. I just don't very often talk to other people that do this. So that <laughs> first time I heard somebody say, oh, you know, you've really, you've really captured that person's personality. And first time I heard it, I thought, oh, well, thank you. That's good. And then after a while I thought, um, I, but I'm not, am I? I'm not capturing a personality. What I'm doing is I'm exaggerating some features. And then we look at that and we go, ah, you've really captured that person's personality. So hmm. that's kind of interesting to me. Like how is, how is the personality the same as the features? Like I, I wouldn't want to think that as much as I might, you know, um, try and develop a nice personality and think about the lessons in, that I've learned in life and put that into how I live. I don't want to think, oh, no, no, it's not. It's just to do with the relationship between your eyebrows and the top of your nose. Um, and yet it's those yeah. that are. Uh, but is it, though? Because well, know, because it's a circular thing, isn't it? God. Yeah, because I think... <sighs> I don't know. In a way, I, I disagree because like my whole focus when I'm doing a caricature, and I think a caricature is way more powerful than a portrait. Mm. Uh, a portrait can be beautiful and, and, and you know, it's a, it's a great representation and, and everything, but you're, 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 it's more math like you're, you're, you're measuring and you're, you know, and you're still looking for those little nuances. And, and I tend to slightly exaggerate portraits a little bit just to get a little bit more personality. Yeah. that's the key right there the look, getting a little bit more of that personality that character the essence the feeling and so mm -hmm. when i'm caricaturing i'm not really drawing what i see what what like exactly how i see it. i'm drawing what, what i'm feeling what okay. and and so if i so i i feel this way about a person like whether the way they move the way they talk a little bit how their their mouth might twitch a little bit to one side all those little teeny things capture the feeling or the essence of the person it's in and that's what i try to capture and i think like if you do that correctly and, and it can be just slight exaggeration it doesn't have to be um you know like like i mean again mm. there the, the, there are there are those artists as well that do extreme exaggeration and the ones that do it and still capture that there's some serious magic there that's like oh yeah you because I think that if done right or with just the right amount, you really can capture someone's essence and feeling to a point of it almost feels more like them than a photo could ever. Yeah. Um, and, and also because we're working basically in like a two dimensional or it could be three dimensional, it doesn't matter, but um, the person's not there. It's a, it's a fake mm -hmm. thing that we've created to represent this person, but what an amazing thing to be able to do that and they're not there and yet it feels like there's some motion or there's some life to it mm. like that's because because i've seen plenty of paintings that are dead mm. that there's that there's that there's no essence there's no feeling uh, or, or you know so then i'm not saying that i that i do that every time <laughs> that's what i strive for though yeah. you know because yeah. i mean but i think some i think sometimes I mean, my personal, uh, I guess, philosophy on caricature, if you want to put it that way, it's all about the eyes and the mouth. It, mm -hmm. I mean, the rest of the features are, of course, important. But when we talk to people, we're engaged with someone. If we're normal and not psychotic, mm -hmm. we look into their eyes. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I watch people's mouths when they talk. Mm -hmm. I watch their eyes when I watch a movie. Um, I, I, that's, that's, that's where my focus is. And when I talk to someone in person and I, I assume everyone does that, um, for the most part. So those are the aspects of a person that I think are the most intriguing. And I think it's, it's those, it's like the eyes and the mouth is where that feeling is, 
You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it also gives us a strain. I'm sure you must get this too, an ability to see likenesses between people that other people just don't miss. You know, you kind of look at a picture of somebody or a friend and you go, my God, don't they look like something? Yeah. Like no one else sees it. And you're like, it seems so obvious. And it is just, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just just the, just the eyes and the mouth. Yeah, I, I just always, I've always found that an interesting thing, that sort of play between personality and, and features. Because we'd like to think in ourselves, we don't really think about our features I guess because we, you know, we can't see them. That's <laughs> the one thing that's kind of hard for us to see. Um, but we kind of probably think a lot about our, 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 our personality. Um, and it's it's just, you know, does, does a, somebody with an angry disposition, is that just affecting their face in a way because they tend to hold their face in a certain way and yeah. then sort of like it sets or it does something with a musculature or is it somebody with a just an unfortunately angry resting face like gets Clint treated Eastwood. a certain way. They get treated like someone who's angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, they start to behave like that, or is it something in the two? But it's, it's, um, I don't know. I, 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 it's, it's interesting in the way that it's something that appears to be kind of profound, but actually, it's just kind of in the surface. You know, something as rich as a personality is sort of might be. I find it really exciting that it might just yeah. be something that's just largely there in the. And I find it interesting with you with your you know, the, the illusional stuff um, mixed with your work, because I, I kind of feel that way about caricature is that it really is like, it's, it's like not just an illusion, but it's an impression. Like I said before, it's not, it's not, they're not there. That's not, it's, 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 it's this thing that I've created, <laughs> but when you look at it, it's communicating to you and you're like, Oh my gosh, that's so-and-so. And that feels so wow. That expression that whatever, but it it's um it is kind of what we're doing it's like you know like like you you setting up um an illusion type thing where you're, you're like you're like planting things in here um that happens in i think in caricature work you're you're setting up certain aspects of a person's face where you're intending them to notice this or look in, in this spot so i think that's that's interesting that you you do that as well. Like I noticed that in your work and uh, where, you know, um, I think in my mind, I'm thinking about this. Um, which piece am I thinking of? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's the one, of, I think it might be a Christopher Walken piece he did. Right. Um, but there's something about the eyes in that piece that I go right to that right away. Yeah. And I don't know if that's intentional. Um, when I do stuff like that, I'm try I'm intending to, for the person to focus there, but there's got to be a little bit of that in your mind, in your your setup as well, because of what you do. Well, I I think there's I haven't really I rarely ever think about crossover between painting and the illusion stuff because it's two different worlds to me. But uh, hmm. saying it like that, I think there is I think the crossover is um, it, it it occurred to me, and it was actually something that made its way into the into the Broadway run recently that that what magic does is essentially quite childish need to impress and so on. But what it is doing is what, when you watch a magic trick and this, although the stuff I do now, uh, and as I should say, people don't know me at all. There's shows, some shows on Netflix and there's a probably a big like rabbit hole to go down on YouTube. I'm sure mm -hmm. and most of my shows are on uh, channel four on in the UK have been on, you know, for the last couple of decades, but there's a bit on Netflix now. Um, so, but with a magic trick, which I don't really do much of, but the magician is making you join up the dots in a certain way so that you tell yourself a certain story of what you've seen. And if there's a lesson in a magic trick, it's the fact that your story of the world is different because you realize something else must have gone on that I missed. So you're realizing that your perspective is not reality, right? And of course, this is what we do every day. We mistake are the field of our vision for the horizons of the world, right? And I'm sure how I said. Um, and it, I realized after a long time that actually something as trivial and silly as magic kind of is a great analogy for how we do this. We have this infinite data source coming at us all the time and we can't process all of that. So we have to pick and choose and edit and delete and just make up a comfortable story that we can, we can work with. Um, and occasionally I do think of this with painting because a lot of it is supplying so much information um and not again not necessarily talking about me or my skills here but just the, the idea of particularly i think with portraiture applying so much and then 
uh, letting people join in, join up the dots. And like, I don't know who said it, but like, you know, the, the viewer is the, is, is the best painter, you know, we'll, we'll do all the, uh, all the bits that complete the illusion as we look at it. And actually we just need sort of very little, but just sort of in, you know, in, in the right mm. place. But then what we do, we, we can convince ourselves much more powerfully. The, the paintings that I've done in one of uh, David Attenborough recently, which I really got into and I made, it was very kind of, you know, detailed. It was, it was fun, but um, uh, it's, to me, it's not as, as real as, you know, other things that I've done that are a bit more sort of, uh, suggestive um and that's that's another thing i suppose so that business of joining up the dots i think links the two and then also the idea of um facsimile has always interested me like magic and painting taxidermy i've got a lot of taxidermy full of peacocks behind um it, it, things that appear real and aren't uh i think is a is a always i love that i love yeah you know, r robots and androids and um, uh, great illusions. And the shows that I do and the sort of stunts that I do now on the t on TV tend to be building like Truman Show worlds for people that they're going through and don't realize they're part of a part of a show. Um, and all of that, I just find so, so rich, how you create something that appears real and, and, and isn't. And uh, you're right, that's part of what painting is. A big thing that separates painting and photography, of course, it sort of sounds obvious, but there's nothing, again, I don't know who said this, but there's nothing in a painting that compels me as a viewer to believe that that moment actually existed. Whereas the interesting thing about photography is that that happened, like that moment occurred yeah. in time, it's sort of been lifted out, um, which I think brings a lot of, I find, I, I'm a very keen photographer and that, you know, I find all that interesting for, for that reason. Whereas painting doesn't, you know, there's nothing in that beyond, you're being, you're being, you're seeing something about the painter, you're not seeing anything yeah. about. That's oh, yeah. true. Although it's something that I've always been fascinated with is that it's just literally, um, well, I mean, I do a lot of digital painting as well, but like paint in general is just colorful mud that, mm. that <laughs> yeah. when yeah. you look at this mud on this painting, you're seeing uh, whoever, the, you know, whatever the scene is, you're seeing an image. You're like, you, you can, you, you, you can, you can be pulled into it and you can believe it exists and but it, it's it, it's it's an interesting thing in fact like when i was first l teaching myself how to paint i used to be very confused about how to capture like I, you know like i i use the example a lot of if i wanted to paint a forest and have fog in the forest what do i just like thin out do i, do I paint the forest and do i just uh, thin out some white and kind of do a wash in there and it's like no there is no fog there's no trees there's none of that it's just the correct correct shape value it's in, like the nose it's like we do that nose yeah exactly it's and it's in when when those correct values and shapes are placed in the correct place in relation to the next one you think you're looking at fog because the the right value it's like it's pushed back in this one spot um it's it's made stronger over here and you're you're getting this sense of depth and everything else and once I understood that, I could paint anything. Mm. It was just like this thing that just clicked, and I and I'm like, oh, I get it. Yeah. And to me, painting is all about values. That's that's like the mm. most important thing I think about. I mean, obviously, there's other things that are important, but that's like the like if anybody ever asks, like you know, that it is funny how many times I get asked, like you know, what's your magic trick? And it's like. I don't believe in that, but I guess I would say values. I, mm. you know, um, and when I teach, I always, I always, I just push that as much as possible. You know, um, I, I was wondering with your caricature work, um, and and that doesn't have to be just character, but uh, how how do you start working on a piece? Because I mean, are you are you uh, do you like do do studies and sketches and and work out what you want to do with that person's features or their, the the overall look and feeling or do you just start right on the canvas? I start on the, I start on the canvas. I, I sometimes will do um, uh, a sketch on the iPad. Mm -hmm. uh, I still find myself brushing off imaginary, uh, you know, when I erase. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. such a um, 
uh, and also checking checking for the you know the charcoaly pencil stuff on you. I've done that while I'm painting traditionally, um, because I go back and forth, and I'll be painting digitally, and I'll be like, um, I, I gotta remember to save. Like yeah. while I'm working on it, I'm like, oh wait, duh, you know. Yeah. But I've really had that I, thought. I need to save this, you know. I pitched and zoomed a canvas once. I was, <laughs> yeah. I was working with the iPad here, and then I went to the canvas. I actually caught myself doing that. Um, <laughs> I uh it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if you did that and it actually worked. I'd be like, damn, yeah, this you know cre this is creepy stay back. <laughs> yeah, it was a good moment. So I um I yeah, so sometimes I do that. Uh but uh and it it's it, but yeah, generally it's it's straight on the canvas. Um and if I'm caric but if I'm caricaturing so I just did one of a, a young Marlon Brando recently, uh, and that was after a series that I was, of them I was taking a lot more care and trying to get things a bit, you know, more sort of exact and um, not really caricaturing so much. So I, uh, this I sort of went back to what I feel is how I generally tend to work and what I enjoy most, oh, yeah. which is just sort of, um, yeah, just a straightforward. I mean, I, I have my bunch of reference pictures, one kind of what I'm working with the most and I got that on the iPad there and I just sort of start and it you know it kind of it's a bit crap at the beginning when I look but I filmed uh, this one because there's a, a, little, a TV show that I'm doing that they wanted some footage of me painting so I can look back and see uh, yeah it's quite large it, too it's a really big uh, piece it's a really nice really, big piece oh uh, thank you yeah it's yeah it's um yeah I, I, I like it but it didn't look I mean, a it's young Brando who looks nothing like old Brando anyway. So that's but it's kind yeah. of my capture him. But um, it didn't look anything like young Brando when I started. But it didn't I wasn't really that bothered. But in the act of mm. doing it, it's kind of like massaging it into place. It's it's very kind of loose. Um, and if I have done any sketches, I'm not really I don't refer to them at all when I'm when I'm doing that. I I like just the sort of is it just a, a kind of a sense of just getting familiar with you know like yeah. a, ro a road map maybe. Exactly that. It's just getting, yeah. it's sort of just getting familiar. And, but I, I remember, um, so I grew up with uh, loving Kruger's work and I, well, I studied yeah. German uh, at, at school and I, um, we had these German magazines around which he used to do all the um, paintings and illustrations in. So like from a young age, I was seeing his stuff and thought it was amazing. And I remember being out in um, hmm. Germany once. I lived out there for a year between school and university and I found, because obviously, you know, his, his stuff's better known out there amongst the general public. And I saw some books of his uh, collections of his work, you know, Faces and those, those, uh, those early. Yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it, first of all. I'd never seen, never seen them presented like that. And I remember standing in the bookshop and spending probably an hour or more looking, looking through these things and bought a bunch. And then as I walked out into a marketplace, I remember seeing a guy walk past me and I saw him as a caricature, like it was a full on <laughs> hallucination. That's awesome, um, yeah. Yep. And, Cause I remember walking past and stopping and looking back and thinking, God, I did actually, I definitely saw it. It wasn't just mm -hmm. like we all kind of do, like we pay attention, we sort of, can, you know, we're just doing it in our heads maybe all the time. Yeah. This was actually kind of, you know, saw it like he had a mask. Um, uh, so I think, yeah, that, that side of it has always been a very, organic thing i find it harder hmm. doing sort of straight portraits yeah it is it's it is more of i know exactly it's hard because i go back and forth between them sometimes yeah. i'm like doing a caricature piece and then the next day i have to paint a realistic portrait and i'm like ah, i gotta like kind of just slow down a little bit more um, how, does it, how does it work with um so this might be a really boring uh question and i'm sure most of your listeners will know the answers but i i've never done digital work beyond just as i said just like a, a sketch um so how does that what's and i it means that i don't know how to look at them like as a like your your um your amazing painting of the Shit's creek cast for example like it's oh okay but i'm looking at that like i painted it and gone i don't know where i'd start what what <laughs> is that what is that process if you're doing particularly if you're doing like a, a very realistic um painting digitally what what how sort of freehand is that process what's the well i mean so you you know what a cintiq is right yes, uh, yes okay yeah, okay I so for a brief time yeah okay so i 
that's what I prefer to work on. And that's actually what I'm looking at you on right now. Uh, I have a 27 inch Cintiq and of course it's pressure sensitive, just like a, it's like a giant iPad basically. Um, but my process is it, it you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, maybe it's just because I've been doing it long enough, but I get asked this all the time. Like, sure. do you find it, do you find it awkward to do digital work, you know, versus your traditional and everything else? And, and to be honest, like, I don't f- feel any different about it at all. And it's, I just draw how I would draw. Um, sometimes the drawing is much tighter. You know, I spend way more time on it or sometimes it's really loose and it's just getting to the point because I'm going to paint it anyways. And um, I'd prefer to just send in a loose sketch and get an approval of the likeness and just let me paint because um, I don't really need to do a super detailed drawing. I, I just need the basics because all that's going to come while I paint. And while I paint, I make adjustments. Oh, I just, I noticed this eye is a little too low. So I just kind of start blocking it up a little higher. And, but I work very organically, if that's the best, I mean, or traditionally while working digitally. Um, sometimes I do underpaintings and mm-hmm. I purposely use a color that I want to, to pop up through the painting later. So I'll kind of think 20 steps ahead. Um, let's Mm. see. I mean, that's, but I mean, I don't really find it, you know, like the Schitt's Creek one was a very weird job because they, they, first they wanted me to do these landscape paintings and they wanted them to be sort of Bob Ross ish type paintings. Um, and they want, they said, just picture like Bob Ross type paintings that I'll hang in a, in a really, you know, shitty hotel or something. And so I was like, okay, they didn't tell me, they didn't give me any real, like they didn't say, oh, there should be some that are horizontal, some that are, you know, vertical. They just, so I just, um, I did a bunch of thumbnail sketches um, based off real landscapes, plus looking at old Bob Ross paintings and try to like capture some of those elements. And so I just focused on those and they're like, these are great. We love these. And then they said, now what we want you to do is now we want you to paint they, they then sent me references. They took, they took specific photoshots, uh, photographs of the actors um, with the, the specific lighting and everything. And they said, now we want you to, to draw and paint them on top of these backgrounds. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Like the, the lighting doesn't match. It's not the, you know, they're like, it's supposed to be as if you took one of these old paintings, a, a landscape painting, and then you just did a portrait on top. So I'm thinking, wait a minute. So their body is going to cover up all this painting that I did. Like all this, like, like some of the paintings covered up massive amount of time that I spent painting. And then some of them were, were meant to be vertical, but I painted them horizontal. It was like this, it was, it was a really weird way to do it. And I had to try to, and what I did was I I actually um, tried to take color from the background paintings and use that to paint their flesh tones and stuff. So that, cause it it would look too weird. Yeah, yeah it ha- it have to there has to be some kind of unity, and basically I just, um, just paint like how I would paint. I'm I'm thinking, you know, I've you know values. So it, is a, it is a purely freehand. Apart from the fact it's digital tool that you've got on your hand, and it's not there's no paint to spill. You're yeah. actually doing a. a mm-hmm. that, that's the thing is it's hard to know when you look at these things. Well, you could I, if it was me, I would, would just trace it, or what? What's the sort of? But it's a very, it's a, it's like you, your painting. I mean, some people do that. Um, I I prefer to draw because I feel like I capture more of my my mm. voice. Mm. Um, sometimes there's been times where, you know, when it's realistic portraits and I don't have I, I don't have hardly enough time, uh, mm. but I have to paint several people. Sometimes I'll do a grid. Mm-hmm. Um, so that I can at least get things proportionate really quick, but you yeah. still have to go in there and draw it all, you know, like, but yeah, the, at yeah. least the grid helps you get like the proportions quicker. And, um, so I'll do that. Um, uh, but really even then it's like, I find that when I paint, it's all, it's all about the shapes and how they relate to one another. So like if I'm working on an eye and I'm getting the eye, you know, as accurate as possible, every single thing that I paint next has to relate to that eye. It has to like the, the distance between the top of the eye and the eyebrow and the, the eye, the top of the, the, the eyebrow to the edge of that, where the hair starts. There's, there's all these shapes that I'm seeing and I'm just painting those shapes. And when I'm done, there's a face. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how I think of it. Um, and like, 
if something's not right, I'll like flip the image or something like that. And you can all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, the nose is going way too much in that direction. <laughs> like that, that'll happen. And that sucks. And then you kind of, yeah. um, and there's been times where I'll lay a photograph that I'm working of on top of the painting because something's not right. And I'm like, oh man, I made his one eye too big. <laughs> so like there, I've done that before just to see like, why is this not looking right? Um, it's amazing how so, useful the iPhone is for that, isn't it? To, especially if you're painting yeah. quite large. You take you take a picture, and obviously it's really unforgiving in terms of you know values and contrast and so on. But you just see immediately everything that's uh, everything that's wrong with it. A, a friend of mine who's a photographer said the same thing. He often takes pictures of his photographs just because you can see where the compositions are for where there's just something not right. But just having yeah. it shrunk down to that is such a such a useful thing. Oh, that is helpful. I my my wife's a painter, and um. So there's times where I'm working on something and she'll just walk in and look at it and she'll go, something does, something's, something's weird there. And, and she'll notice something. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. Thank you. And other, other times I'm like, do you mind? Like, <laughs> I don't do this to your paintings. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. In the, the studio I used to have, there was a mirror up and I remember just catching sight of that once, of the reflection. Oh no, it was in the window. That's right, it was in the window. I was painting at night. And it was the first time I'd seen just how bad something can look in reflection and you know mm. warped and uh, uh <laughs> it's weird yeah it, yeah it is weird and actually the last one of brando was mentioning like that looks really really bad flipped his whole head is sort of going off like this but then equally it's kind of nice as well you know it's, you, if yeah that i don't you wouldn't end up with anything with any life in it either. no i mean that that's it's it's one of those things where I'm that I think that's what pulls me into it and has me continuing to, to, to be interested is that it, it's, it never gets old. And with painting, like you were mentioning before oils, I think you should mess with oils uh, mm. just because I, you're the kind of person that likes to be challenged. And oil is, is one of those mediums where, I mean, there, there's a lot you can do with acrylics. Obviously, you can do a lot of things with it, but with oils, it seems like the the, the amount of techniques and and approaches are endless. And um, and it is it is um, I I I could be wrong, and some people might not agree with this, but I kind of feel, and I'm not a chess player, so I feel like I, maybe I shouldn't even use this analogy, but I kind of feel like like there's checkers and then there's chess, and mm. acrylic painting is like checkers and mm oil is like chess because you've got to think ahead a lot. You've got to plan. You've got to think about, you know, drawing time and all this kind of stuff. But the thing is, is there's been so many times where I've been working on an oil painting where I, in the middle of working, I'm like, you know what? I wish I was doing an acrylic painting right now. Like yeah. it, I always have that feeling where, and then when I, when I did, I haven't worked on an acrylic for a while because they, it starts to frustrate me. Um, but that's what I started with. But there's times when I do acrylic where I'm like, I wish I was doing an oil. Why am I doing this? So it's it's kind of it kind of goes back and forth. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I've I've always I think whatever I've done, painting or anything, I've always looked at people better than me and gone, I should be doing that. I'm not really, I'm not really very good. And that 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 is sort of how I've nudged forward in anything that I do. So I definitely yeah. have. That. I have a friend who's um, a great oil portrait painter and i just sort of i presume that's kind of that's what the grown-ups do and uh, <laughs> i but you know what though i mean it's it it's whatever whatever floats your boat i mean kruger still does acrylic and he's amazing um um gosh what's that that austrian artist um no he does oils and stuff as well i'm blanking on his name right now amazing artist um god damn anyway but there's there's a lot of artists that do amazing things with acrylics. So, I mean, um, mm. and and I, I disagree. A lot of galleries will say like an oil is worth more than an acrylic, but it's like, dude, is it a good painting? It's a good painting, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I I personally just feel like acrylics, like I, I can't stand how they dry darker, and I can't stand that when they when you you mix up one color and it dries, and then you try to go back in and paint something, it 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 won't blend in. There's no way. Um, there's so there's a lot of things that way that just drive me bonkers with it mm, but oil yeah. has its challenges as well but um one thing that you might enjoy about the oils is the little bit of a longer drying time being able to work into 
something or you know you notice there's a, there's an edge that looks harsh you just take a, a soft brush and you just just mm. soften that baby up and it's like oh it's like it's really satisfying <laughs> we're like when you do that with acrylics it's like just to soften that edge is it's it's a it's really frustrating yeah um yeah. so yeah. yeah you just i mean and here's the thing who it, just try it <laughs> you know yeah, exactly it just it feels why like am i giving you advice well i will do that i'll have a um I'm, i will sit down with this friend of mine and have a or stand up rather and have a good sort of session of working it out it's just it's just always slightly intimidating me but it took me a long time i said to get rid of the school paints and move on to uh, acrylics with the same reason yeah uh, funny you're talking about the fog it was make and then talking about edges of things it, it, it just it's also struck me like i've been painting a lot this year like lo lockdown is you know great great time for painting um and like selling them for the first time that's like that's a new thing really for me so it's been there's been a lot of painting um that's and great. i think i've i think i've got better as well but it's it strikes me that like you're saying with the fog how um unlike I guess a lot of other disciplines um, with, with, the, with the painting, but it, particularly if you're working from a reference picture, I guess it's a photograph is a little different, I suppose, if it's, if it's life, which brings its own challenges. But how the process of getting better is, and again, it goes back to the idea of maybe the stories that we tell ourselves and just, just not being able to see clearly because we get caught up in a story. And we do that all the time, you know, with, Paintings, because you go, oh, that's a, he said, that's a fog, and which is a sort of a story about what it is, rather than an actual just what's there in front of you, and that thing of like realizing you're just seeing what's there with less and less stuff getting in the way. Like so, the edges of things. Like I've been really enjoying the edges of things, like over the last yeah, few yeah. Years of painting, and like I'm not discovering anything that wouldn't have been staring at me ten years ago when I. Or even two years ago when I hadn't quite seen that. Or those little, you know, turquoisey fringes around a highlight. Um yeah. you, have, you know, a patch light in the eye, or like there's a little, there's a little turquoisey fringe there a lot of the time. And like, and that's there. And I just wasn't seeing it. And now I am, but the, nothing's changed. Like I'm not looking any, I guess I am looking a little deeper, but not really. It's just a thing in a, a thing in a picture. I find that um kind of interesting because then it means when you've when you've, you know, you've got it and you've made that step, you're like, well. Well, you know, why didn't I? Why didn't I see that? What was I? What was I missing? Because it's not like other skills where you might actually kind of um, develop a deeper, like performing, for example, like getting a becoming a better performer is, although it might look very natural on stage, you no, know, it, it isn't. It's sort of a, it is a fabrication. So you're you're learning skills that are not necessarily intuitive and straightforward. So with, with painting, it's sort of in a way, yeah. it's it's just there, and you're just going to copy it and put it there. And I know that's like ridiculously. Uh, reductionist but in in theory mm. it's not like a really straightforward thing I've, I've just i've been surprising myself with that and going why didn't i yeah no that it? happens for sure i mean i i look at paintings i i, I oh, man i hardly like anything that i've done like i'll i'll <laughs> look back at something and just just see all those kind of things like what how did i miss that yeah. like what what in the world and um you know, I, I don't know. It, it's just one of the, like I've looked back at paintings and that I thought were really great, and then I see like this really hard edge somewhere. I'm like, yeah. what the heck? Why? How did I not notice? And I just want to go back and redo it or whatever. But um, it's just. And do I you mean, do you ever go back and change them? Well, I don't have the actual painting, you know. Otherwise, I oh, probably I would. Or, um, but I mean, and there has been times, especially with some digital work. There's been times where I've you know. I've noticed something later. I'm like, oh man, I got to go back. I got to, you know, cause like most of that stuff is I'm just working crazy deadlines. And so I'm just trying to do the best I can. And I, I basically hit send and it goes and it gets published. And I'm like, oh man, like there's one time like with the Shit's Creek thing, um, one of the, uh, uh, Dan Levy, um, one of the paintings of him, his, one of his hands, it has, is, is like very hairy. Um, and then the other hand, there's no hair on it. I forgot. In life or in your picture? In my in my in painting. Your picture, right. okay. Yeah, I for I, after it was published and everything else, I looked and I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't paint any hair on that hand. Like I just you know lost track and 
and uh, it drives me crazy. Like I'm like, oh, and it's such a, such a little thing that no one probably noticed. He, he didn't pick you up on it. He didn't. Uh... No, I mean, this was on billboards and stuff. And I, I, that's all I'm going to look for now. When I look yeah. I, I, yeah. It's, I think it's, I can't remember if it's the solo painting or if it's the, there's like a group painting I did. And then there's a solo one. I can't remember which one I did that to, but one of them it's oh, like that. But, um, curious. but, uh, Hey, I have a, there, there is, I have a question for you a little switch in direction just a little bit here. Um, if you don't mind. And I, like I said, I was watching a couple things just because I wanted to, um, just to catch up on some things. Cause it's been a little bit, and I wanted to see what you've been doing and different things. But I came across this, this show that you did, uh, Do You Believe in God, Faith and Fear? And I thought it was so fascinating. Um, and again, like, just like this, the whole mindset. And I find the reason I f find this fascinating is, is I, I myself am an atheist, uh, but I was raised um, my whole life to be a hardcore fundamental Christian. Um, and, you know, from, so my, my mind was, was clearly conditioned from the moment I was born. Um, everything I was taught, everything I was told, I just accepted without question. Um, and it took me until my mid thirties for me to climb out of that deep well. And, and what, once it happened, my mind was blown. I mm. couldn't believe and I was angry and I was embarrassed. Um, I was like 30, around 30. Um, when all of a sudden things started to click and I was just like, what the, you know, and, um, and I, and I just, I've been so fascinated with that, with this, the whole thing ever since, but you've got this episode where you, you basically, there's this girl, Natalie, uh, who you're, she's an atheist and you're, you're, you you set this whole thing up and you're trying to see if you can convert her into, you know, in, into feeling, you know, this, the spirit and this presence and these different things. And she gets really emotional uh, and it's pretty intense. And, you know, and, and as a person who was a past Christian, um, because I was so convinced about things, I felt things I, you know, and, and, um, and I know now, like, with all the crazy things that have been going on, especially here in the United States, uh, with our election and um, and what happened on, on the sixth and and, and and at the Capitol, um, I can I clearly see the um, well to me it's a it's it's a it's a clear cult is what it is, and and you can see how once once someone's mind opens up. To, cons to one conspiracy it's mm. so easy for them to accept all their other conspiracies or other conspiracies especially if it fits their narrative or their worldview and therefore it's, it's easier for them to 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 do crazy things <laughs> to, mm. to react in a crazy way and, and do different things um, so i wanted to i wanted to read you this one thing though and i and i have a, i just have a question about it if you don't mind and then we can we can move on but um with, with a couple of, so basically in the show this is something that you said um you, you said um as our ancestors developed language it also meant that they could uh they could gossip through gossip your reputation could be damaged which meant you could be um you could be outcast because others could discuss your misdeeds and that makes you someone to be avoided and it could uh put you in danger could also make you less likely to reproduce so we learned moral behavior to keep us all happily ticking along together and our survival chances and the safest way of ensuring this conformity and therefore increasing our survival chances would be to believe there was some divine presence that might still catch us out when we thought our our peers weren't around so our invention of an all-seeing supernatural force like god to moderate our actions and us being on our best behavior just because we're told there's a haunted chair in the room, it's part of our hard wiring of our brains. It once helped us with our survival chances, et cetera. Um, and it most likely explains why even atheists often betray even a tendency to give purpose and meaning to events in their life when they really shouldn't, given the, that they don't believe there is a supernatural force or agency at work. Uh, so we've got this supernatural all-seeing force overseeing us, but how do we make it a reality in our lives? We need to personally um, 
uh, we need to personify it, per personify it, sorry. Um, we hope that this force is strong and wise and loving and all the attributes found in a classic loving father figure. So there's, it goes on a little bit, but I thought it was, the whole thing was a brilliant experiment. Um, but I had a question concerning that. And my question was playing devil's advocate. Um, if our brains are hardwired to believe in supernatural forces, um, as well as the gossip um, aspect that you shared, in order to increase our survival chances, which you believed uh, helped develop because of evolution, couldn't it be equally argued that is proof of a God and that God hardwired us to be that way to separate us from other life forms um, so that we would, you know, then have morals and so on, uh, which would obviously come from a God. And uh, my, my personal view is that I feel like human beings, um, my, my understanding that I've come to on this and my belief is that I believe that human beings uh, from our very nature are superstitious and gullible at heart. And this is why we have religion and gods in the first place. Why we don't understand the stars, we don't understand tsunamis, uh, you know, well, well, God did it, you know, the God of the gaps argument. So I was just curious about that because I think you could, in that argument, you know, our brains are wired this way, but couldn't, couldn't have a God have wired it? I'm just curious. You're a yeah, yeah, yeah. on that. Well, um, I, I should say I'm an atheist as well, right? Which was the, the point behind the program in case anybody mis misunderstands why I was converting an atheist to, uh, to, <laughs> at least to, to give her a feeling of a, relig of a religious experience, yeah. which is the idea. Um, I think the answer to that is, uh, yeah. I mean, in theory, a believer could say, well, all of those things are explained by um, a God that put them there. That's, that's, that's okay. Um, it isn't... Uh, evidence or proof for that though because you, you that stops at the first rung which is the normal explanation first which mm. is all oh, those those things are there and they may explain why we um why we sort of create uh, a god for ourselves is is a much more plausible explanation uh, plausible explanation than oh well no god put them there because that begs so many other questions well what's god and who made him and how would you know or her um so so I think there is a thing of, um, uh, David Hume gave it to us in the 18th century, that extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. Yeah, so if exactly. you're making a claim that is a, like it's a big claim, like there's a God or there's a, there's a ghost in my house, or I've got a <laughs> unicorn that lives in my, all, all these kind of claims. Um, that's, I mean, fine, you can make those claims, but if you want people to take you seriously, you, the, the sort of evidence that you're gonna provide just needs to be really strong evidence. So yeah. it's not enough to say, for example, well, you can't prove that I haven't got a unicorn and leave it at that. <laughs> well, no, but that's not yeah. the point. Like there's a certain burden of proof that's, that's on you. So, uh, so yes, of course that's a response, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really support that. It's not a, an argument, it's not an argument to, to, to support the sort of God hypothesis there. However, for all of that, I don't think that show that I did sort of answers the question and I don't think it answers the most interesting questions either it was specifically a, it was built on the idea of wouldn't it be interesting to take yeah. an atheist scientist to give it this experience I think the um so I, I also went from like a strong belief to yeah. uh, around probably the same age actually as you uh, about 30 to uh disbelief and then you naturally swing to a very strong disbelief because that's kind of, kind of makes sense that's where you've come from and then maybe that sort of you know soften so i i don't believe any more than i did at that point i'm still a, a very much an atheist but i think there are other other things in religion that are interesting and human and compelling rather than just this kind of evolutionary explanation. yeah I think it's, a, it's a richer experience than that and i don't think i sort of that mm. show would do it justice so i think yeah here's, here's what i think i think there's an experience in life of transcendence, whatever you want to call that, just a small T, whatever you want to apply it to. It just means that thing that is bigger than you and you lose yourself in that thing. Now that's, that is important for us. It might be painting or it might be your kids. It could be anything, but yeah. um, that's how you find meaning in life. If you lack meaning, you need to find something that's bigger than you and throw yourself into that. So that's a really core part of the human experience. And it's different from seeking to be happy. It's di different from seeking what's true, which is a very, you know, that kind of scientific mode, but it's really important because it's ultimately the people that lack meaning that are the ones that are going to, you know, throw themselves off a building. That's a good um, point. Yeah. So, so that yeah. at some point, probably if you take, if you take say Christianity at some point, 
something was happening historically, whatever it was, and people were maybe getting a sense, a, a feeling of that, that sort of other, that bigger thing than themselves. Something was in the air historically, whatever it was, not anyone rising from the dead. I, I, I don't mean that, but there was something that people were involved in. And then as time went on, whatever that historical figure was of Jesus and whatever, passes from immediate memory so to kind of keep that going as a community and as a as a as a um, as a force it becomes a, a a belief which is different from whatever it was at the time which was probably more about an experience so now you've got a belief and the belief is now held afloat by things like dogma and practices and rituals which again are very different yeah. all, what it's what's <clears throat> starting to happen is you're pointing back to something that was of some kind of human value at some point mm -hmm. uh <laughs> But you're pointing back to it, and then that community be becomes you be politicized and powerful and moneyed, and then you end up with a church, which and now you're starting to enter a world, but it becomes quite easy to knock this thing down, uh, particularly if you're an atheist. Particularly as that church becomes maybe corrupt, or it moves into an era where we are now, where the idea of proof, like scientific proof, is how we all sort of operate. So that's now what we're starting to demand yeah. from the kind of religious world: was where's your proof? Um, and so they come up with these yeah. terrible things like, but I mean, even, fun. even the, 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 what drives me crazy in, in, in is, is the, just the basic fu fundamental idea of this is where you should get morals from, right? This is, this is kind of what I liked from what, what you're, what you were saying as well. Um, is that, you know, we, we're hardwired to feel this way and this is how we, we, you know, we have morals or where we get morals from and we feel like someone's watching us and all this kind of stuff. But it's kind of a funny thing because the idea of God self contradicts it's, it's, it self contradicts itself because you've got this all knowing, all powerful thing that you believe in yet. It, this thing isn't all powerful and all knowing, um, you know, for example, we'll keep it simple. Like, you know, COVID, um, you, you, please pray for me. I, I'm, I'm very sick. My family's sick. My husband's sick, whatever. Um, who created COVID? <laughs> like it's a contradictory. I mean, if you, if you believe that these all, all knowing, this is all knowing all powerful being, well, then you have to accept the fact that he's allowing this to happen and he created this as well. You can't look at a beautiful sunset and say, Oh, this is amazing. You know, you yeah, know, this I is just glorious. That. But then a tsunami, you don't give the credit for a tsunami that kills 11,000 people. And it's just, it's kind of a silly thing. And I think, you know, the, what's, what's interesting about it is you get wrapped up in like, like in the religion aspects of aspect of it, you get wrapped up in this, you know, the comfort of it. Like, they, you know, you find comfort some for some reason that there's like this being overseeing and looking over you and everything. But but I find that a lot of the people that are caught into this don't question anything else. But but what if like why, you know, why? Like the, the questions, they're, they're, you're not asking the right questions. And I just find it really fascinating because, you know, this there's this again it just had me thinking because of all the things that have been happening recently with the whole QAnon thing and, and the things that people are believing and people, you know, respond and say, Oh, they're absolutely bonkers. And this is insane. Like, how could anybody believe this? And it's like, well, people also believe that a dude walked on water and they believe in pregnant virgins. I mean, there's, there's people believe in weird shit yeah. and <laughs> they're, con they're convinced of these things. And then it's, it's pretty easy to be convinced of all this other stuff as well. Yeah, well, I, I, and I think that the, if you're sort of pointing at COVID, I, I remember, I remember um, after the tsunami hit Southeast Asia, I remember a, um, a priest on television in the middle of all the <laughs> death and tragedy saying it's actually been amazing to see uh, God at work here in terms of how people have <laughs> received healings and been looked That's after and seen this outpouring of kindness. Um, but, all the, I, you know, the thing is, I thought you meant God at work here, like how how hard he's pushing the waves and destroying people's no, but, homes. But that's the point, isn't it? It's the rest <laughs> of us. What are you talking about? What about what about the other big thing? But like, it's it's a story, isn't it? So whatever yeah. story you you create, you're going to make, you're going to keep that story working, even if you have to. What seems to the rest of us maybe torturously bend it round to fit to fit what's going on. But, but that's that's just the story you tell. I, I think the. Um, you mentioned the morality thing at the beginning. It's always worth remembering that we don't we think. You know, people say, well, the Bible has given us our, 
our morality. But it doesn't, because no. when you look through the Bible, the first thing is there are clearly things in there that, you know, would not be good moral advice to us now. There are things in there that are awful. So you kind of, you decide, well, not those bits. And be- God does them. <laughs> but what, is it, what, what authority are you... Um, yeah. Are you sort of are you drawing that from when you decide not that but this? You're, that's not from the Bible because it's the Bible is the very thing you're looking at. So there's clearly a, clearly a higher sort of yardstick that we're working to, which isn't from this, because yeah. that's the thing that allows us to go. We'll disregard that bit, but we'll, we'll keep that bit. So mm-hmm. unfortunately, that argument of you know we get our morality from the Bible doesn't doesn't work. Uh, it falls apart on that reason. Yeah. But no, I, I think we Drives all, whether it's conspiracy theories or, or whatever, we're all out in the world going. Where, where do I stand? You know, who am I? Where do I relate to this world, to this, these other people and these, you know, the, who, who am I? What's, what's my place? And particularly nowadays, when you think more in terms of conspiracy theories, we, we get, again, it's like a magician doing a trick. It's like some little thing that you've missed and then your reality is starting to be like this. You don't know it's happening. You think <laughs> you're paying attention. You think I watched everything very closely, but you're not. It's this. And we're all like that more than ever nowadays we're all in these you know these these little tunnel visions so you look at somebody else who's next to you like that seeing a completely different reality yeah. and you think they're an idiot and they're not that we just all have this very touching need to know where we are and we get we're just unfortunately being fed a lot of tunnel vision if you combine the tunnel vision with a complete lack of education then you're definitely in trouble but we're all we're all subject to this and i think i think it's you know worth remembering that and also worth remembering that within these things that do seem mad, there's, there is something often very human being articulated. You know, I'm, it, the, the right-wing urge will seem mad to the, left, to the lefty, but the right-wing urge is essentially about protecting the group. So you fear outside threat, you protect your group, so you hang on right. to all the values of authority and tradition, religion, that keep a group strong. And the, even if that's at the expense of the weaker people, right, that they may suffer within that vision. And in the left vision, it's all about protecting the interests of the weaker people. So it's about compassion, which is a different urge. Um, and that can happen at the expense of the overall structure. And that's fine because that can change. That should change and progress. We want to look after the people that are poor. So this is like one urge and the other. They're actually both really important. And right, yeah. We do need to look at these things and kind of go, well, all right. Balance, balance yeah. is key. Yeah, because truth will come from, always come from a dialogue between. Uh, yeah. But that's, that's awesome. That's, I want, that's why I wanted to talk to you about that, just because I find it really interesting because you yourself um, have, you know, controlled uh, conspiracy, like bits and different things that you've done, where you've convinced people to think a certain way or to do something. And I just find it really interesting because, um, you know, I, I, I find myself getting in, you know, getting in little arguments here and there about this kind of stuff where I'm just like, it seems so obvious to me. (laughs) <laughs> and it's 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 just frustrating sometimes but um i like your perspective on on the right and the left i think that's a really good way to put that that's, that's really that's really good um but anyways i we have a few fan questions i want to get to oh, yeah, and, yeah. and i don't want to go to you know you, you've been so gracious with your time here um and i don't want to forget these people so let's uh let's check this out real quick here questions from fans Mr. Brown, big fan of yours. I think 20 years ago, uh, Mind Control came out. My roommates and I in college thought you were the devil. Awesome stuff, man. Uh, you're you're great. Uh, my question is, do magicians at your level all know each other? Like David Blaine or this new Delgadio guy? Uh, is, uh, is it a supportive community? Do you guys all get along? Uh, respect each other's work? Uh, what's all that about? Uh, can't wait to see what you do next. Uh, please don't make Jason disappear. He's got much to give. <laughs> that, oh, was Al- that was Alex Joyce, by the way. Alex, that is a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked that, and it's it's such a good question. Um, okay, so I think, yeah, I think the answer is at the kind of at at the kind of professional level. Um, not professional. Well, at whatever level um, Alex was talking about there. Uh, there is a lot of there's support and there's um, respect and there's all the kind of um, yeah good behavior and general kind of um, admiring each other's work and and I think that's yeah that's good but there's 
there's that and then there's like a bulk of of the magic world which unlike a lot of other worlds say the world of comedy for example there's this leveling thing because like if, if you're a comedian you you know you are there's comics and there's people that you know tell uh, tell jokes or I, I, as in like you know they've, they've read a joke from a book and they tell it you wouldn't think of yourself as a comedian you just told you're someone that told mm -hmm. a joke whereas with magic there's it's a much grayer area between well what makes that guy good when he might be doing a really simple trick that you might have just got out of a cracker and the guy that's just done a trick out of a cracker so there's this kind of leveling thing so what you get a lot of um uh, as a magician, like, you know, you, you might do a show on stage, a few thousand people and I come out through stage door and there's a magician there giving me notes and telling me what was wrong and, mm. and, um, and letting me know that he knows how they're all done and stuff like that. And so there's, there's that kind of weird thing that I don't think translates to other, um, <clears throat> other crafts so much. I mean, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have the guy that tells jokes, giving a professional comedian notes on his, on his act. Um, <laughs> it's so that, funny that you came up with this analogy because Alex uh, is a stand-up comedian that I do oh, com okay. I do comedy with him like we've yeah. done mics together and stuff so it's kind of funny how uh, yeah well I, I knew you did the comedy I didn't know Alex's that's that's, that's, right. that's yeah. so funny but I mean that happens like you you do like a set and you know it's really it's a great feeling when you when you do a set and other comics come up and go dude that was funny but sometimes you know be like <laughs> that sucked dude or like that one joke don't do it again or like you know i think it happens that would be considered rude oh yeah of course <laughs> yeah. it's, it's sort of just a given within magic like, we're all cheating we're all in the same boat. and it's only like i think a few people that are, have really made a strong career out of it that get that that isn't you know that yeah yeah <laughs> all right here's another question this this question here this is by manny um, Manny Avetti, uh, hold on a second. Here we go. Hello, Darren Brown, longtime fan of your mind. And hence, I was pleasantly surprised to see that you're also a master painter and caricature artist. And I wanted to ask you if you would consider uh, honoring us with your presence as the guest of honor to our annual caricature conference with the International Society of Caricature Artists. It's held annually in November, and uh, any year you're willing to come by and uh, talk caricature, talk shop, and um, have a good time. It, it's a week long, and uh, it's different places every year. But anyway, Jason Seiler has been guest of honor, so he can uh, share with you some of the insights. But um, just wanted to throw that out there. We'd uh, absolutely love to have you. Uh, anyway, I hope you like the uh, art, and uh, thank you. Thanks for uh, hearing me out. Take care. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That sounds that sounds great. I I always suffer from like I don't think that what I do has any <laughs> is good enough for anything. But I'm very flattered if if, uh, if they're asking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm probably going to be touring this November. So it may not be this year, but yeah, that's lovely. Thank you for thank you for the. Uh, for the offer it's it's finding time is always the issue Did i have a very yeah. <clears throat> schedule but yeah of course of course i'd love to i mean it, it's hard that's that's been my thing with it is i i enjoy going just whenever i can but it's it's always november is always a busy time for me mm. uh but it's really it is really somewhere a great warm. experience is it somewhere warm where do they do it uh usually yeah i mean the last one was um uh, in memphis um, this last year was supposed to be Vegas, but of course, you know, we did it. We actually did an online thing and I took part in it. It was a lot of fun. Um, and we all like drew each other and painted and stuff, but um, you'd really like it. it it's um, like when I was a guest speaker, I basically did like a workshop type of a thing, um, but mostly just hung out and I actually did some drawing and painting with everybody and um took part in there in the competition and all that kind of stuff but it's pretty cool man there's artists from all over the world that just um you know you, every every artist gets a wall space and they you, you you have to draw and paint other artists that are there and you have to do the work while you're there and you just fill up your space and um at the end of the week there's almost like an oscar like ceremony where everyone dresses up nice and it's it's like dinner served and it's just like this fancy thing and and uh, they hand out awards and uh, whatever else. It's it's a lot of fun, you know. It's a it's pretty cool, and and everyone really pushes each other 
yeah. to like take, try to take things to the next level and um, whether it's exaggeration or use of color or whatever. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. All right. Uh, oh, well, that's nice to be invited. Thank you. Yeah. I think you'd enjoy it. Uh, so I've got a question here. Let's see. Um, this is a strange question by my, uh, by this guy, Juan Gastelum, um, but he's a strange fella. So that's to be expected. <laughs> Hello, Darren. Have you ever been reverse hypnotized by a white Sumerian ghost or an alien in Halloween or Independence Day? Okay. See, see what I'm saying? Like the question would have been great if you stopped after have you ever been hypnotized by someone reverse, else? Reverse hypnotized. Yeah, reverse hypnotized. What was the last bit? Or what? What did he say at the very end? Um, <laughs> I, just like like a white. I thought he said, a, a, I don't know. It, it's an alien and a yeah white supremacist ghost or something. I, I'm not sure. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, I, I think I think that's a no. I think that is that is a no. <laughs> yeah. That's a no. <laughs> That's what I would, um, yeah. Well, uh, I think of a funny answer, but it's like, there's no, there's no. Question. But, but have you been, um, I like the first part of it. Like, have you been a reverse, reverse hypnotized? hypnotized? Yeah, I, I was, I got sidetracked at reverse hypnosis, wondering what, what that could be. Cause it does yeah. sound quite, um, quite good. Um, have I been reverse? So I suppose that means I am trying to, I'm trying to hypnotize the white supremacist ghost. But <laughs> I'm a fool to myself because it's backfiring and uh, I myself yeah. I'm succumbing. Um, it hasn't <laughs> happened yet, but I'm going to, I will be aware of those uh, things are real and real and valid dangers. He did a, a, a drawing of you. So I think it'll make up for oh, this. Okay. Um, so here's last question. This is by um, Eric Goodwin. Hey there, Darren. Hey buddy. This is Eric Goodwin. I'm a caricature artist. I also like making music for fun and doing other creative stuff. And I've been a huge fan of yours for over 10 years. I've seen all your shows and specials multiple times, and I gotta say, you're one of my favorite creative people. I also get inspired by people like Conan O'Brien and Eminem, because I feel like creative people kind of tap into a similar energy, and it doesn't really matter what the art form or the genre is to be inspired by it. Uh, I'm wondering who and what inspires you creatively, and also, do you plan to ever be a guest on Conan? Because that would be awesome. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, Eminem, I'm Conan O'Brien, and me, the, the old gang. Um, <laughs> Get the old gang back together. Uh, uh, who inspires me? I, um, God, I, uh, painting-wise, that's really, it's actually really hard to say. I mean, Kruger had always been my... Um, my guiding light when I was younger and uh, um, now it's like whoever I find on Instagram and half of you, I don't even, I don't even remember the names, but I just love, I love looking yeah, at yeah. stuff. Um, that's kind of amazing. Um, magically, uh, there's a guy called Chan Canasta who was around in the fifties, so a Polish, um, he performed in England, uh, but a Polish guy. Um, and I kind of, really liked his way of working and it was sort of it was mentalism which is you know technically what i what i do um uh another guy called david burglass british uh, performer now in his 90s uh, so you know well retired but um another great guy i love penn and teller i love some of their um work particularly particularly teller's thinking he's he's written a lot about um his sort of philosophy of magic which uh, we're good friends and that's something you know we've spoken about a lot so he's definitely had a uh, a, a real um, effect on me too. Um, mm. I think generally in life, it's it always seems to be it always seems to be friends. I'm always kind of like really just admire people that um, just really like the people that when they leave a room, you're like, oh wow, they were great. Who were they again? You know that kind of like that was a great. Who was that? Was a great. You know, I love that. I always thought that was that was something to aim for. Um, <laughs> in life. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, that was the second part of that question. I've I've forgotten that with my. Uh, I think the second part was, are you ever going to do Conan? <laughs> yeah, sure. If they ask, <laughs> well, at some point it'd be nice to go back and do another um, Broadway run or a tour or something in in the states. So that kind of obviously yeah. is 
it on hold. Well, I saw you on Jimmy Fallon. Uh, that was hilarious. Yeah, that was fun. He felt he looked like he was quite. Uh, Quest was like looked a little uncomfortable and freaking out a little bit. <laughs> I, I, I find all of those. I mean, they're always um, like the guys and the presenters and the team and the, everyone's always amazing. But I just find them. I hate doing them. I find them terrifying. Oh yeah. Uh, such a huge amount of work that goes into rehearsing. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask. Do you have to do like a practice first? Yeah, no, not not with them. But there's that'd be like a month of me just working with the guy that I, you know, directs my shows and we kind of work together and just getting getting something just right. And you always feel it's just going to be less than. Like you come and see the show and you're seeing something that's you know polished and and hopefully impactful and more than you're expecting. But we've got to come up with something it's, completely separate. I gotta say, man, the 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 preparation. And everything that must go into that it's, it's got to be grueling because i mean obviously like your performance like the thing that you did on, with james gordon um with the number 45 that was insane it, <laughs> that's what i was thinking of that was like I, a, I, i'm not gonna ask for the tricks but it's it to me i'm like there's no way that randomly you went on 45 and he's that fucking good at math like yeah. that quick that fast it had to be planned to be 45 and how in the world did he get 45 pieces of rice? The, it, it was fascinating. And I've never seen anyone do a magic trick with, with numbers that way. And it was just unreal. And then you, you, you're clever to fit his birthday in there and everything. It was like, that was a performance. It was awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, it was, yeah. it, it was, it was a lot of work to make something look like it wasn't a lot of work, but um, yeah, it was, it's, it probably, looked yeah, they're, like, always, they're always real. They're such, it's sort of amazing doing these things in America, just the, the, the bubble that you enter and you're sort of, you know, picked up and you're put through things like that, those kind of shows and everybody's amazing. And uh, I had, um, what's her name? Um, Charlize Theron burst into my dressing room thinking I was the bathroom, thinking my dressing room was the Oh bathroom. my gosh, that's burst hilarious. Door, saw us and screamed and went back out again. Um, <laughs> don't let us stop you, we, we screamed. But uh, yeah, that was that was like a strange moment that probably wouldn't have happened in, uh, in London. Did a... Uh... The, the the bit you did with James Gordon where he chews the glass and you choose the glass. Did he was it really chewing glass? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 did, like... I did this in my stage show every night on a previous show. So I'd get somebody up and we'd um we'd sort of eat a light bulb together. Um <laughs> and it was a thing about you know just taking risks and you know committing and just yeah. it's, actually, it's one of those I should, <laughs> how well are you yeah, putting together? It's not that dangerous if you're really, really careful. So, you know, kids don't, but um, <sighs> yeah, that's it's just incredible. about, it's incredible. like walking on glass, walking on glass. First time I saw that, I, uh, I went to a friend's house who I knew did it because he had a, like a circus act mm -hmm. and he smashes bottles and walks them. So I'm just thinking, oh, well, they must be fake bottles, but I know they weren't because a minute before I inspected those bottles and I smashed them, but you just go, oh, it must be fake glass. Mm -hmm. And then, I thought, right, you just you can just do it if you're careful. And then I would do it on stage every night and everyone's saying, oh, it's fake glass. And it's 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 you know really hard to it is it it is I mean, there obviously that's that's the one thing I love about that kind of stuff is you know it's like it's again, you know, back to the whole the God thing is like, you know, like some people look at something and they've got the God of the gaps idea of, oh, well, God did it, you know, where I look at something and, and it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay to say, you know what? I don't understand, but because I don't understand something, I'm not going to say that a, a magic wizard in the sky did it. I know there's some kind of explanation. So like when I watch the stuff that you do, I'm like, it's so genius. And I, I, that's why I love the art of it because I know there's an explanation to this. I know there's something and that's, what's so awesome and intriguing about it. Um, but like, that's why I was asking about the glass thing. Cause it looked very convincing that you guys were eating glass, but I was like, no, he's not going to have this guy who's got host this show and everyone loves him. He's adorable. And he's like an actor and all this stuff. He's not going to, he's not eating glass with an apple. There's, there's no way. And I thought it was like, like sugar candy or something like that. So I can't yeah. believe, That's I mean, he must've had one hell of a shit after that. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's important maintaining a sense of mystery. That is important, isn't it? If you yeah. have the trouble with the God of the gaps idea that, that you know your idea of God is fitting the bits that we don't know and don't understand, that you you have an image of God that's under threat because that's constantly shrinking and that's you know so you've got an insecure. Uh, yeah. starting point. But it's it's it is about mystery, and I think look, you know stories. As I said, we all tell ourselves stories, and we know about those stories. And stories are things that are told like 
round a fire in a clearing, like they're cozy mm-hmm. and they're lit like this. And then you've got all of this dark forest on the outside that isn't included in that picture, all the stuff that's being excluded. Uh, and that's where, you know, that's where the monsters are. That's the rest of the stuff that is not yeah. included in your tiny story. And we do it with ourselves. You know, there are parts of ourselves we don't acknowledge. And we shove out like that. And those monsters do come back and get you because the things that you don't consciously acknowledge within yourself, that the unconscious things do end up with a sort of a power over you and they tend to come back and get you some way. So we're always, we should just like retain some respect for the fact that our story is just a story, particularly as we're told, you know, nowadays to own your story and take authorship of your story. And the very idea of story is like, it's spoken about a lot, but there's another side to it, which is, yeah, and it is just a story. You know, your your perspective of the world is just your perspective and and, you know, Hopefully now we're gonna just we're all, everyone's gonna you know take a breath and start to uh, have a bit of time for what's outside of just this. Yeah. It's, it's really you know it's 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 hard, but that's 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 what life is, isn't it? You know if you if you understand everything, then it's just dead. There's no yeah there. exactly. Yeah. The mystery is gone. Um, so right before we end this this bad boy, um, I want you to see some fan art. And uh, a lot of people were excited about this. And so there's a, there's a good amount of uh, submissions here. So let me see if you see this. I'm going to switch it over. Let me know if this <clears throat> works. Mm-hmm. And... <laughs> I love that. Oh, these are going to be great. I can't wait. That's great. <laughs> um, wow. yeah, so this, this... I'll take anyone with hair. <laughs> this first one is by Tony Lewis. That's good. Yeah, That's you... good. I've tried to paint myself so many times and it's, as I'm sure you feel the same, it's really hard painting yourself. I'm always, so it's really interesting watching other people doing it and, and being able to see yourself in it properly. That's, that's great. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Um, I am blanking on this artist's name. Maybe you can help me. Um, he's an Austrian artist. Oh, Aust- yeah. um, uh, but this reminds me of his work a little bit. Um, he's got his work in museums in Austria. Um, I am, so annoyed that i cannot think of this artist's name right now ah, it'll, it'll come to me um but it reminds me of it's it's this this drawing style in this has sort of uh vintage mm. type it does doesn't it yeah it's got like this look to it and i'm i cannot believe i'm blanking on this name but anyways um here's the second one this is by phil harvey and he he did two so i just put them together so you could see them Oh wow! I feel like I've seen the one on the left, but maybe, uh, maybe I haven't. might be an older one or something. I don't know. That's I think great. he did say that actually. It says 2015 now that I'm looking at it. I'm really happy that he's got the triangular um, sort of thing at my head. I, it's uh, I've got the I've got very sort of flat ears that go to a little triangular thing there, but I also have a <laughs> this strange like, and I never really ever see that in drawings because obviously they're you know generally done from the front. Um, so yeah. it's that's very rewarding to see that too. God, I love these. Yeah, it is very nice. It's a nice drawing. Well, I don't know about you, but I just whenever if someone does a picture of me, all I can see is like you know the amount of time and uh, like <laughs> a, a affection that's gone into them as well. Because you know you it's it, that's just what it's like. That's great. I love that. Love them both. And <gasps> yes, that Neil Davis, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. This is Neil Davis. Yeah, you yeah, know it. That's really good. Really, really good. Yeah, I like this one a lot, man. This is. Um, the use of color in this is just awesome. Yeah. It's really, really cool. I love that shirt. I know exactly that shirt and jacket. <laughs> By the way, I was going to say, what a nice sweater you've got on today. I like that sweater. Oh, I love this. Thank you very much. I love this. I'm very, very happy. It looks with very cool. It's kind of not too <laughs> thick and it's just, it's just right. So that's, that's, thank you. Thank you for noticing. Uh, yeah. The, your, your sweater and, and the, the design of, of your home there. I just feel like, sitting there with and smoking a pipe or something i mean <laughs> yeah that's it's very nice um uh, Ooh, this, wow. this is by jonathan groot wow and i think this is a this i think this is a traditional drawing that was scanned yeah, yeah it reminds me of um God, I, remember, I love all of these it reminds me of is it another guy jonathan levine is that his name there's a guy that um does very um uh, i don't think he's around anymore but did sort of pen, very meticulous pen and ink, very tight cross hatching of authors, Hemingway and Kafka, and that was sort of his world. And it reminds me 
a little of that, or even though the style is obviously different, but the um, the drawing style is different, or the painting style, but the uh, the the sort of geography of it really reminds me of him. Um, yeah, love that. It's really unusual as well. I haven't. Seen, you know, yeah, it's it. interesting style. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and by the way, I figured I figured out the artist I was sticking out for that first one was uh, Egon Egon Schiele. Oh, Egon Schiele, right? Yeah. yeah. Like there's yeah. something about the that style yeah. that just. I don't know, there's something I, about his aesthetic there that I could, it felt like that a little bit. I have what I thought was an original Sheila uh, uh, at home, and I think we've just found out the other week it isn't, uh, but that was really exciting, oh, <laughs> the original drawing of his. Um, yeah, I really like that. I find that really mesmerizing. Uh... <laughs> oh, I love that too. God, they're so different. They're so good. <laughs> this Do is you... by uh, Jacques Lamanier. You've right. You so you've got all the good ones here. That's it because I do see paintings of me, but you know most of them, of course, are not my <laughs> not my people doing a very good job. Of course, but they're not artists, and and so I end up. It's lovely to see a bunch <laughs> that actually really accomplished. I love that. My God, yeah. Really, uh, again, it's it's so unusual. It's not the sort of normal thing. I love the bumpy head. I love the <laughs> mouth. This is really nice. Yeah, the mouth eyes, the expression eyes, is really nice. Really eyes nice. are really uh eyes are really spot on. And look, yeah, he's got he's got the sort of flat ears with a little um little triangly bit. I know what I mean by <laughs> that. He's got this thing there. Yeah. Really <laughs> like that. Really like that. Very much. Yeah, it's cool. Maybe my maybe my favorite so far. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and uh <laughs> this one is by Roger uh Bustamante. Bustamante. God, it's amazing people are doing this. And he's really gone to town with the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. With this. Um, <laughs> what is that? Spell? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's I'm, interesting. Yeah, it's now that he is. Yeah, this is... I, I quite like all this stuff. I never... I think I, I very rarely smile in pictures until just recently. So none of the... I used to have like a goatee and when I had the hair, I'm very rarely smiling. And so it's actually quite nice. Uh, I haven't really seen pictures of me smiling, so it's really nice seeing this. Thank you. <laughs> Rob, Rob. I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna say. So I'm gonna be ending that whole smiling thing now. From now yeah, on. Yeah, I'm gonna stop having seen this. <laughs> this is, yeah, yeah, I will never smile again. Yeah, this is this is the last time you'll see these pearlies. Uh, <laughs> oh wow, Jesus! <laughs> Who's this? <laughs> I, uh, I love this one. Uh, this is by Manny. Um, I always. Manny's a friend of mine, and I can never say his last name right. Evetison, Sen, Yveti Yansan, Sen, I don't know. I can't say your name, Manny. It's just, it's just Manny. Um, he's the one that asked the question about inviting you to come to the ISCA convention. Oh, that's him, is it? Yeah, yeah. He's awesome, yeah. man. His work yeah, is great. I, I love it. I know it sounds insincere just saying I love it to all of them, but I really do. But it's the fact that they're each so different and surprising uh, yeah. uh, is, is what's really Get me. He's got a really interesting take on my mouth there. Yeah. It's still, it's still me, and he's got the the weird head shape too. Oh, I love it. This one is just he, cracks what's me. What's he up. using? You know, is it watercolors or? No, this is a digital painting. Um, I, I can't remember the. It's. I think he did it on the iPad, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong, uh, but uh, yeah, love it. it's, it's digital. Yeah. But he he works traditionally as well. He's he's awesome. He's so quick too. It's crazy. I love the little, he's got this little, uh, which I'm sure I have a little thing there by my eye. I love that. I'm sure you find this too, that um, when you, cause I, I'm often like, I meet people, like I tend to meet famous people that I've drawn, like it happens a lot. And you just get obsessed by, you know, you've there's some little nick or little thing. And then I meet them and all I'm doing is just watching for those tiny little, <laughs> tiny little things. That I know I was like, you know, obsessing over for weeks while I was, while I was painting them. And then you want to see those things like live and move on the face. So, oh yeah, yeah that's I'm, interesting. That's, that's a that's a fun little bit there. Yeah, I love that. That's great. God. This one's cool. Oh, wow. This is by Dominic Zeilinger. Okay. Yeah, I don't don't know him. Ooh. Love it too. It's like hypnotizing. Yeah, yeah. I shouldn't I shouldn't look at it uh directly <laughs> for too long. Short bursts. Um, I suddenly feel like assassinating someone. I also like, I love the fact he's put the dot in one eye and not the central dot in the other one, which slightly just makes it do this a bit, doesn't it? It slightly vibrates it. It and, does, yeah. actually. Hurts my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, <laughs> and here's quite the, con quite the contrast here. Um, <laughs> this is by Dwayne Stockton. 
good teeth. Wow. Yeah. Love all of that. Um, and I, I particularly love those teeth. I, uh, I remember years ago, um, I think it was Kruger's painting of um, Mick Jagger, and it's part of a series of certain long ones he did. And I bought the prints mm. from one of them um, LA once. And I loved the way he did the teeth. And I got a bit obsessed after that with, you know, getting teeth right. And those, I think, are, are the finest teeth. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's very nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, love it. It, it, it is funny going okay. from the last one to this one. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, no, that's right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah that's great. Um, oh, oh, yeah. That's from the um, the experiments. That's really good, isn't it? This is by Scott Black. Yeah. Um, great. It's pretty cool. Slim there as well, which I'll take. That's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, uh, oh, that's very good. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. a few more. Uh, this is by Ewan McTavish. This is. Yeah. Yeah, this is pretty cool uh, color palette. It's really, yeah. it's really interesting. I really like that. Yeah, yeah I really do. Is that a, a, acrylics? Was he doing that digitally as well? That is digital, isn't it? I think. Yeah, digital. I think it is digital. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. Um, God. It almost to me. Um, if we get a little nerdy on this, but it almost looks like a split comp palette in a way, with the comp, the opposite complementary colors and then you split so you don't i don't know if you know what that palette is but it's it's kind of like a it's like a um just your your basic palette like you know red yellow and uh and blue sorry but um but then you 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 turn it i don't have a palette here to look at to get it just right but so basically if you choose uh like red the opposite of red is green, but you don't use green. You use the splits on either side to paint with. So you're still oh, okay. using three colors. So, so green's d directly across from the red. So you're going to move over and you're going to use a, a green blue for your, your blue color. And then you're going to use um, the, let's see. Uh, maybe it's a green yellow. I can't remember. I have to, I, I, I'm blanking right now, but basically what it does is you, you, you're not going to, you only, you're going to, you're going to choose one color. That's basically your dominant color. Like let's say red, mm. and then you use the splits of that on the other end. So you, you're not going to use a, a blue, you're going to use a blue green and you're not going to use a yellow. You're going to use a yellow green if you're use, if you're working that way. And so oh, whenever yeah. you need to mix a blue, where you're, you're, wherever you would normally use blue, you're going to use that blue green instead. Yeah. And uh, this palette gives you a unique harmony and you can't really copy colors exactly like from a photo, but you get really uh, interesting results that way. So yeah, yeah. I had never heard of that. And I, and I, I'm impressed with myself. That actually makes sense to me as well. I yeah. I kind of butchered it no, a little no, bit, no, but no, 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 it's really <laughs> I love that. I love the, shape of the nose and the it's giving me some really nice angles there I, that's that's really that's a yeah that's a joy i love that one yeah i, I like the color a lot it's really cool here's a fun <laughs> one <laughs> it's by ken coogan i don't i don't i don't recognize where that would be from actually which is quite nice the others i can sort of i can remember the photograph that has been used i quite like this this is this feels a new hmm yeah that is interesting oh. it's pretty cool i like i like the the palette in this too is a nice like like mm. like subtle tones going on here and it's really nice yeah and the the use even though it's digital the the use of the brushwork and the block end feels like almost watercolory it's kind of cool i love the uh i love them just a the little little tip of light there on the ear yeah uh, <laughs> yeah that's it's funny. That's really nice to look at. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ken. So oh. nice. This is by Christine Varadi. God. That's very good, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I believe this is an iPad painting. Yes, it looks like it. Yeah, it looks like it might be. Um, wow. Yeah, she did yeah, it. She, she did one last week when I, I talked with Brad Garrett and... Um, and I and she did a similar thing with this. It's really cool. I like that she does like it looks like she does like an underpainting, and then lets some of that color pop through. It's really nice. Yeah, 
yeah, you can, really you can tell yeah. she's a painter. Yeah, yeah, totally. It has a feel of it like those um, those Snapchat or those those things that you hit above and you kind of get this enhanced version of your skin. So like your skin goes quite smooth <laughs> and you, you're sort of oh. a bit prettier. It's like it's it's really pretty. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the pretty. Yeah. Uh, Here's an interesting one uh, by Graziano De Carlo. By Roger Crumb. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I could see that. <laughs> it's pretty interesting style. style. It's, yeah, it's really. It's, these are really interesting, and it's sort of um, slightly sad too. Which is always, always a nice <laughs> note. You know, it's interesting too. Is just like how far things have come because this is a digital painting as well, but it really does have a nice traditional texture. Yeah. Um, and you know, sometimes with digital work. It's, it's like trying too hard to appear traditional and it kind of screams for attention uh, to yeah. me anyways, or it just, there's something not right, but this actually just legitimately feels traditional. So it almost has like dirty smudge marks and stuff. And it just, I, I, it's kind of an interesting technique. Yeah. Of- yeah, exactly. You can really, you can really feel a, 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 a real hand on this, which is, yeah, it does, you don't normally get from the. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, so, <laughs> so here, this is Juan Gastelum. This is the one who asked the question about the hypno, uh, self <laughs> hypnosis or whatever. <laughs> These are hilarious. <laughs> he, That's great. Yeah. yeah. I love it. That's a <laughs> UFO, right? Got it. What's that? A bowling ball? Is that like a magic eight ball? Do you think I'm, I've got there under my hand? I wonder what that. I mean, it, I would imagine that. I mean, it, it, it you would think that would be. A little extra weight you wouldn't need on a magic carpet ride but you know it is a magic carpet so yeah, it, yeah, yeah exactly don't want that on a magic carpet that's probably the rule <laughs> yeah uh yeah i love it and it has that glow around me which i do actually have yeah um, can't see it on zoom but I, I do have a natural a natural oh i see it i can see it uh, um, yeah that's wonderful Ooh. so the, uh, this is so yeah. the one on the right is by dustin clark and then one of his students did the the one on the left, and, and it's done by uh, Elon McNeil. Brilliant. So, yeah, that's yeah. got a really cool drawing so style. But just yeah, God, yeah. I love it. I I really I really love those. And don't, say Daniel Clark, could you say no, uh, Dust, Dustin Clark? Dustin Clark. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I don't I because I don't recognize the. Um, Photograph if he's using a uh, so it's it, it again it feels like a very new well, actually neither of them particularly so they feel like very new experiences of myself to look at which is nice because it's, it's yeah that is interesting slightly kind of unnerving and uh, <laughs> and, and it's like they're like they're so right well there's yeah. enough there's enough reference of you out there so it's it, yeah yeah it's nice to be surprised by uh, yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> Uh, so here's the last one. This is by Eric Goodwin, who he's the one that asked the question about uh, oh, yeah. Conan and, and all that kind of stuff. This is really interesting. I'm stepping right back because I feel like I feel like I need to for it to fall into place. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's beautiful, I'll, isn't it? I'll email these to you as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, God, will you please? Will you let me? Yeah, I'd yeah. love to have these. Um, Eric, thank you. That is... Yeah, this is this one is so interesting. It's really interesting, isn't it? I love it. God, God, the eye color as well is just spot on. Yeah, it's it's pretty hard, isn't it? Getting people's eye color when you're looking at internet pictures, and often it's hard to. What I like about this piece is that it is so, you know, obviously bizarrely pushed, yeah, in exaggeration ways. But I, it's still I can see you. I mean, you really captured, um, like, like, like we were talking about before the feeling. Yeah. You know, like and and um, just even like, I mean, I don't know if I, if I'm looking at this. Or, oh no, it's it's like the what do you the, the card, um, you know, the little throwing in the shapes there from a from a you know playing cards. Like even with the shape of the nose, it's just like a nice little subtle thing. And and I love the little teeny suggestion of your mouth because you do have a small little mouth. Thank you. And Thank and he's got this little teeny you know suggestion underneath, and, and it's just like it's so funny. Um, 
Yeah, I, yeah, this is interesting. It, this this is so far removed from my approach or technique or thinking when it comes to caricature, but yeah. um, I really like it. It's really cool. This, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. It's um, it's hard for me to see myself in it, and I think you'd need to, <laughs> I need to not be me to get it. Was with the others. So yeah. This is it's a very different experience, um, in terms of it sort of clicking into place for me, but it's, I love it. I. I I love it and I love the the <laughs> thought and the design and everything that's gone into it and just yeah, seeing seeing myself as you say, just pushed in that. Yeah, it's interesting, man. That way it's really uh, yeah, it's a di- very different experience looking at the others. And you get little, Thank de- you, Eric. little devil horns there. Of so. course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So well, that was such a treat. God, what a ego fluffing um uh, <laughs> that was. Thank you to all those people. Yeah, thank you so much for all that, um, for everybody that submitted. And man, we've been talking for two hours. This is awesome. This is, uh, I wasn't, I didn't know we were going to go this long, but this was a really, really, you know, for me anyway, it's a really great time talking with you. And it's, uh, there's so many different things, I mean, to talk about with you. And it's, it's, um, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and um, it's, it's fascinating to me hearing like even your approach or your thoughts about your art compared to, you know, like, like, again, you've got this, 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 you, you, you're very well known for the illusion stuff. And, and, and then the painting thing is like what I first, I think I first knew you from that. Really? Um, yeah. Like years ago, I, I like, I don't know if it was a, a following on blogs or what it was. It was a long time ago when I first saw your work and I, uh, you know, we kind of wrote each other like a long time ago. Um, and that's what I knew you for. And it was really funny because I was watching, I think it was, I don't even, I can't remember what year it was, but I was watching some show and, and there you were. And I'm like, I was confused because I never really connected the two until then. And then I realized, Oh my gosh, that's the same dude. It was, it was very strange. Um, and, and it, you know, it's funny. It's a very similar thing when it comes and, and I, I'm not trying to uh, compare you to Sargent, <laughs> um, <laughs> but the same thing happened to me with Sargent where I thought Sargent was um, the, mo- the most brilliant watercolor artist in the world, which he really he was um, one of the best watercolor artists. But and I'm used a- his magic show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I, I was obsessed with his water. I, I love watercolor painting. I still love it. And I, my dad bought me this book about his watercolor painting. And that's what I knew him as. Right. Um, and then when I, uh, I went to art school briefly, um, I was in a watercolor class and they asked us to, to talk about our favorite, our favorite inspiration. And I said, uh, John Singer Sargent, and I kind of got laughed at a little bit like what? And it was at that moment that I found out that he's known for his, his amazing oil portraits and paintings and the watercolor thing was kind of like a side thing or whatever mm. and it was very interesting that because it, it was i had a completely flipped uh, and then of course i got, i got really deep into his oil paintings and he's mind-blowing but yeah. um but well, it's just great joining up of dots i mean that's kind of who i was thinking of i guess that thing of giving us so much and we fill in the rest ourselves he's the yeah. um the, the charcoal drawings are phenomenal i don't know if you've seen those there i saw them in new york while i was there um Oh yeah, no, I saw them. There was a show here in Chicago. It was unreal. Oh, just, I mean, they feel like they've just been just been done. Like you know, yeah, that way. Um, just astonishing. Yeah, he's, he is really very special, isn't he? Yeah. But anyways, that's 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 what's interesting about that's. I was thinking about that before I talked with you. That it's like it's funny that I knew you of, um, you know, I can't remember where I was following you. Where where were you posting? Like, like gosh, at least ten to fifteen years ago. I don't know. They were, they were, they were, yeah, that was the age of fan forums and blogs and things. It must have been blog. Yeah, yeah. it must have been blogs. Absolutely. Yeah, because I used to do the blog at that time as well. Yeah, um, I was supposed to, that's right. I was putting my pictures up on them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I remember, <laughs> I remember having like crossing paths uh, all those all those years ago. Um, yeah, that's nice. Well, thank you very very much for having me there because it's it's nice to, have, you know, finally. Um, yeah. Yeah, to talk to you probably uh, about it, and really nice to me because I don't very often get to talk about this stuff at all. So it's it's yeah, that was, that was it, I really appreciate. Uh, just it's fun to be able to just be able to t- talk about anything, go in any direction, and just um, and uh, it's it's a real pleasure talking with another artist like this. So I really appreciate you taking the time, and um, 
uh, again, like, I don't know if you uh, have anything coming up that you want to share with people, um, let people know, or, I mean, I'm sure you, everybody knows, you just look up, Google the guy, you'll Google find him. Guy. Well, I've got, I mean, uh, if I, I have said there's a few shows on Netflix, uh, including a stage show, Miracle. Uh, I should be touring, um, it looks like it's going to be the autumn uh, this year, but that's just kind of the, that's just the UK uh, with my new show, which is called Showman. Uh, I've got a book out called Happy, which I wrote a couple of years ago, and then just released one called A Little Happier, which is a short, a sh essentially a shorter version of the same book. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm working on another one at the, at the moment. Um, that's that's kind of it. And then just yeah, my, I'm painting and painting and writing. It's such a great uh, thing for the moment to be able to have yeah. that rhythm of those two things. It's uh, yeah, that's that's good. That's great. Awesome. Well, thanks again, man. Uh, so cool to be able to talk to you and, and talk about all this stuff. And uh, thank you everyone else for joining me and we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jason. You want answers? 